This is Duke University. This week on Office Hours. On May 8th, North Carolina residents will vote on a proposed amendment to the Constitution stipulating that marriage between one man and one woman would be the only domestic legal union recognized in the state. Janie Long, director of Duke's Center for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Life, and Duke alumnus Stephen Petro, former president of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association, opposed the amendment. Long, who has directed the LGBT Center on campus since 2006, is concerned about how the amendment's passage could affect those in the Duke community. Petro, who has written for NPR, CNN, The Huffington Post, and other news media, says the amendment could harm the civil rights of all North Carolinians, not just those who are gay. Long and Petro join us today to take your questions on North Carolina's controversial constitutional amendment. I'm David Jarmel, the head of Duke University's Office of News and Communications. Welcome to Office Hours. We're less than a month away from North Carolina voters heading to the polls to vote on an amendment that whose supporters call the Marriage Protection Amendment and portray as a defense of family and traditional values. Dr. Janie Long, you prefer to call it Amendment 1 and have a different view of what it's all about. How would you describe this vote? Well, David, I think a lot of people have the misconception that it's about making same-sex marriage illegal. And that is not what it's about because the fact is that same-sex marriage is already illegal in the state of North Carolina. What it, the way that the amendment is written, it's much broader than that. And it really will uh, invalidate all domestic partnerships in the state of North Carolina, which means it's going to have an effect on a lot of children, a lot of families, a lot of our senior citizens. And I think that's something that is highly misunderstood in the state. We'll get into all of that in a minute. Stephen Petro, you write about LGBT issues for a national audience at the Huffington Post and a number of other places. There have been similar votes in other states over the past several months or recent years. Provide some context for what's going on here in North Carolina, and you live here in the state. I do, and uh, there's been tremendous interest in, in this ballot amendment um, nationally. Uh, it's been actually really fascinating to see after the votes that have happened in Washington State and Maryland, where we've seen um, same-sex marriage move forward. We've also seen in New Jersey that the governor vetoed a bill, and Governor Christie, governor Christie sent mm -hmm. it back. Yeah. Um, so we've had like two steps forward, one step back, and now, now the focus comes to North Carolina, and all eyes are here. So it's um, it's really an important um, it's an important vote. I think it's also important for folks to understand that in the South we are the only state that does not have this kind of constitutional amendment. And as Dr. Long noted, um, we already have a prohibition on same-sex marriage in this state. So. Um, it's a real punitive element to this particular um, ballot amendment that will um, cause harm to uh, gay men um, and lesbians, bisexual and transgender people. And I think that what a lot of people don't understand is that for, um, you know, for someone like me who has a partner, you know, in this state, um, not only is our relationship not recognized, but some of the real bread and butter issues, you know, um, we have no protections, such as, you know, if um, my partner were in the hospital, um, I would not necessarily have any legal rights there. Mm -hmm. um, those are real you know, issues that matter to every, every person. But supporters of the amendment say that um, marriage has existed a certain way in North Carolina and more broadly for many, many years. Why change it now? What's your answer? Well, one of, I mean, one of the arguments that is made is that marriage has always, always been this way across sort of all cultures History. and all, all states. And, um, and that's not true. And, you know, and I know that many of the um, uh, proponents of this amendment, they, they actually hearken back to slavery days as a model of um, the way you know, marriage should be. And I think you know, if we've learned some lessons from the past, it's that the past is not always right. But the real point is there actually are different models of marriage throughout history. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, even the dictionaries, you know, the boring dictionaries, have changed their definition of marriage in the past five years. The Oxford English Dictionary now has same-sex unions as part of just the definition of marriage. Concepts evolve. But Janie, when you hear someone say, um, what's the big rush to change it now? What's your answer to that? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of humorous in a way. 
who rushed to change it? The North Carolina legislature decided to bring this amendment forward at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and they bring the amendment forward not to guarantee people rights, which is what we think the Constitution is about, but rather to strip rights from people. And this will be the first time since 1835 that the North Carolina Constitution has been used to strip rights away from citizens of North Carolina. To me, it seems like we're moving backwards, and, the, and who called for that is the North Carolina legislature. Right. So another argument from the other side is that the real purpose of marriage, historically, is to bring together a man and a woman to give birth to children and to provide a, a, a family unit to raise those children. Uh, there was an article in the News and Observer recently from one of the proponents who wrote that marriage, quote, does not include the concept of homosexuality. So are you, in fact, trying to change a longstanding view of what the purpose of marriage is? Well, first, I think the first thing to note on, on that point is that many LGBT families have kids. Yeah. You know, my sister's a lesbian, and she and her partner have two wonderful kids. Um, you know, there are millions and millions of kids in same-sex relationships. So, you know, that's one of the fallacious arguments that's, that's made, first of all, that uh, gay families don't really exist. And, um, you know, and then as to the definition of marriage, again, that, that is never anywhere actually defined. It, some people believe that, and everyone is entitled to their beliefs, but to put it into the state constitution is a very different thing than allowing all of us to believe what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. It also, it also does away with all domestic partnerships. It's, it's not just same-sex marriage, it's all domestic partnerships. So for instance, if you have senior citizens who are living together because if they uh, actually... And this could be a heterosexual... Could be a, absolutely, mm -hmm. a heterosexual couple living together um, who um, are not married because if they were married they would lose many of their benefits um, that they have, uh, that are well-earned benefits, that they would not be able to make it if they actually got married. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're hurting a lot of people that fall outside of the, the uh, range of same-sex partnerships. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is really all the seniors who are living in sin in, in you know, the retirement homes here, they actually I'm, have something at stake here. They can lose their rights too because of the poor way this amendment has been written. Yeah. I want to pick up on that in just a moment, but first I want to remind everyone who's watching that we invite you to join the conversation here on Office Hours. You can send an email to live at duke.edu. You can contact us on Twitter using the tag Duke Live, or you can contact us through the Duke University Facebook page. Stephen, I want to get back to that about the practical consequences that you see from the amendment passing uh, and Janie, something you said a moment ago, which um, you, you, were, you were saying that, well, you know, we're not the ones who force the vote. Why do you think that the proponents of the amendment chose now here in North Carolina to raise this issue? Well, um, it is the first time uh, in quite some time that we've had a Republican majority in the legislature. Yeah. And um, I, the... There's been talk of this for several years now, and I'll have to say that Equality North Carolina um, has worked very hard in order to keep this amendment from coming to a vote. And Stephen mentioned earlier, you know, we're the last southern state to do so. And it's very interesting if you look over the past couple of years, if you look across the country, most states are moving towards some type of recognition. The only other state I believe that's not recently is Minnesota. And so, in many ways, it makes us look as though we are moving backwards instead of forwards. And if we, if we want to talk about broader consequences of that, then we have to start talking about the impact it's going to have. You mean on in terms of North Carolina's reputation or how people around the country perceive the state? Our reputation, our ability to yeah. attract business to the, to the state of North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, about 90% of all Fortune 500 companies now offer protections based on right. sexual orientation. Right. Uh, in North Carolina, there are uh, over 50 major private companies that offer same-sex partner benefits currently. A lot of these businesses um, are looking at what's happening in North Carolina. 
and, and deciding whether or not, like Apple and Google, right. uh, the whether film, they want to locate the, here. Whether they're going to hear more from actually from some of them uh, in in just a few minutes. Um, but first, it, it is important to note that many people do support this amendment, and I think it's important uh, since there are two guests, both of you today. Uh, are opposed to it that we do hear from someone on the other side. And I spoke yesterday via Skype with Rachel Lee, who is the communications director for Vote for Marriage NC. And we're going to roll a few minutes of tape from her. Uh, we have an ex some excerpts of that conversation. So let's hear from Rachel Lee. Marriage is good for society. It uh, is the best environment for having and raising children. Uh, social science research has proved that. Um, marriage is good for business. The top 10 states for business, as has been seen by uh, Chief Executive Magazine studies and Forbes studies, show that the states that have marriage laws, strong marriage laws, uh, and amendments into their constitutions protecting marriage actually perform best um, in a business environment. So um, marriage is good for our economy. Uh, you know, when, we're, when we create a stable environment for having and raising children, and we produce strong children, uh, we are in essence fueling our economy with stable workers. This amendment is about preserving marriage between one man and one woman. And to say that North Carolinians don't have the right to come together on May 8th and preserve marriage as it's always been, um, that's not discrimination. That's just protecting an institution that has been part of North Carolina's history before we were even a state, and before the United States was a country. When they say they want to extend marriage, when they want to broaden the definition of marriage to include other types of individuals, what you're doing is you're redefining marriage. You're saying that marriage is no longer between a man and a woman, as it has been for thousands of years. You're taking that definition and you're changing it, you're altering it. And one common misconception about a traditional marriage versus same-sex marriage is that the two can somehow coincide. States where same-sex marriage has been brought into effect by a judge or by a legislature, religious liberty has been under attack because when you bring in a new legal definition for marriage, anyone who is a, who ha, whose religious convictions are not in line with that new legal definition, they are actually at odds with the law, and we've seen that in cases in New Mexico and in Massachusetts where individuals' religious liberty has been under attack because of same-sex marriage. Well, marriage in and of itself, we have a lot of restrictions on marriage. For example, I can't marry um, a 12-year-old. I can't marry my brother. I can't marry my dad. You know, So we have a lot of restrictions in place, and even if you were to impose same-sex marriage, you'd still have restrictions on marriage that anyone could call discriminatory. So what we're talking about here um, is, you know, if they want to call that discrimination, that's fine, but if they want to bring in if their, their ideas of, of altering the definition of marriage, in essence, they would be discriminating as well because there would be restrictions that they would be placing on marriage. That was Rachel Lee from Vote for Marriage NC. I want to thank Rachel again for taking the time to speak with us on Office Hours. And I would want to remind everyone who's watching the program that we invite your questions as well. You can reach us on email at live at duke.edu, on Twitter at Duke Live, or on the Duke University Facebook page. Stephen, what do you think about what you just heard? Well, a number of things really stood out stood out to me, David, and and one of them was the notion that um, you know, marriage is the best environment for raising for raising children, and that's um that's an argument that's been made a lot by by this side, and something I wrote about in the Huffington Post two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. There are no studies that show that, and when you look at um, every single major medical and psychological association, the AMA, the American Psychological Association. There are 45 empirical studies, completely bipartisan. All of them show that it makes absolutely no difference whether you're in a gay family or a straight family or have two moms, two dads, or, or one of each. And, um, you know, think back also to, um, you know, the families that we also know where, you know, there's divorce or there's widows and widow, you know, widowers. You know, those families do fine, too. It's the quality of people. And um, so this argument for um, these studies, it's, it kind of gets under my skin because they don't have any data to actually back mm -hmm. that up. Do you find it insulting to gay families? I do. You know, I find it very insulting. And I, you know, my, I have to say my 16-year-old my niece who lives in New Jersey who has um, two moms has, uh, 
has become an activist and she's testified at the New Jersey State um, Senate on behalf of her parents. She wants them to be able to marry um, for her sister and her own sake and um, I'm so proud of them. It's also indirectly a slam against single mothers uh, and a lot of people don't think about that but there mm -hmm. are a lot of single mothers in this country and when we continue to say over and over again that the only you know, right way or the only healthy way to raise children is an environment where you have one man and one woman um, and single dads too. I should not rule out single dads. Uh, you know, there are a lot of single people raising children and that mm -hmm. does not mean that those children are being raised in an unhealthy environment. You know, the other thing that she said that kind of got under my skin was, um, you know, States that have um, marriage amendments, they, they, perform, they perform better economically was I think the point that she was making and it strikes me as very odd that with the general economic trouble that we're in in North Carolina now with unemployment over 8%, I think it's still 8.3, yeah. that we're not focused on jobs and job creation and that this, this amendment actually has the potential to increase unemployment for the reasons that Janie was talking about in that many companies in this state will not be able to attract the kind of high qualified right. employees that they need. And isn't there a concern among companies as well that even if they are in the state already but they offer benefits to their employees that those might be in jeopardy and cause some of their better talent to leave? Sure, absolutely. And a lot of uh, cities and county governments currently that offer uh, domestic partner benefits, mm -hmm. uh, these will also be on the table. Mm -hmm. Janie, you are the, the head of Duke University's Center for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Life. What are you hearing about the amendment from students, faculty, and others here on the Duke University campus? Well, the students have been very invested in fighting against this amendment. They uh, approached me early on and they wanted to form Duke together against constitutional discrimination. And they uh, have met very faithfully week in and week out. They've done a lot of things to get the campus motivated. They've done a lot of things to reach out to the Durham community. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be an early voting site here on the Duke campus that we're very proud of that will open on April the 19th. And who is that open to? Do you have to, do you have that, to be a North Carolina citizen to vote there? Uh, you do. You you have to be registered to vote in the state of North Carolina. You can do that on site. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be at least 18 years of age. Um, what else? There. If you go to Duke Libraries, has a very nice website about this that has information. And so, if you uh, Google early voting Duke Libraries, it will tell you everything you need to know. Right. And that's in a location right in the center it's, of the main, the main part of the campus. Yes, it's in the old Trinity Room of the West Union Building. Right, which, for those who don't know, is right, right in the heart, right near Duke Chapel. Right, mm -hmm. and, and it starts on the 19th and runs through May the 5th. Mm -hmm. And I don't so, know when the semester ends, but if, if students are going to be leaving, they should vote before they, should they vote. go. And, and Duke together, the student group, has, has really worked to get a lot of students registered already. Right. But again, anybody... Um, who's in the area who wants to vote on the Duke campus uh, can do that. Even if they're just from, from the neighboring community? Even if they're just from the neighboring so, community. So, Janie, you, you said that um, a number of students are really pretty energized about this. Maybe you can tell us about Jacob, and then we have a, a video of him. Maybe you could set it up for us. Oh, Jacob is... Um, oh, Jacob. Jacob Tobiah mm -hmm. is a sophomore this year and he is amazing. And he's from Cary, North he's Carolina. He's from Cary. He grew up right here. He is a Point Foundation scholar and he uh, has headed up the Duke Together initiative with Elena Botella and uh, Dave Carger and Hannibal Person. Uh, several students are involved, but right. Jacob really has been the driving force. Right, and Duke Student Broadcasting recently did a short video featuring Jacob and maybe we can take uh, take a look at it. We did a lot of work this, earlier in the semester making sure that we had an on-campus one-stop early voting site uh, and, and in collaboration with Duke Student Government we got that done. So there's going to be one-stop early voting on campus uh, from April 19th until May 5th. 
which is really nice because students can vote you know, toward, all the way up until the end of their exams. Uh, that's one thing that we worked really hard to do. Another thing that we worked really hard to do uh, was we worked with the Duke administration to issue a statement as an institution, uh, sort of saying where we stand on Amendment 1. And, and it ended with the phrase you know, that we stand alongside the LGBT community in seeking a more equal world. Uh, so while it didn't officially, it wasn't the administration officially coming out against Amendment 1, it was certainly them making their voice heard on the issue. February 24th, we had our kickoff rally where we had student speakers speaking about Amendment 1 and why it's important to them and why, you know, why they stand against it as individuals and why we as a community need to make our voices heard on the issue. Uh, so that was a really exciting event and we registered like, you know, something like 200 voters or 100 and something voters, um, which, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but given the fact that Duke doesn't really have an active voter culture, I would say, uh, it, was, it, it was really exciting. Thanks again to Duke Student Broadcasting for that clip. Janie Long, you have other concerns about how the amendment might affect Duke students in particular. Sure. Um, several things come to mind. You know, our students uh, receive negative messages every day. This is just another huge negative message for them to, to receive. Um, the day that the legislature voted, uh, students were in the uh, center watching the results and um, it was really painful for some of our students. You know, we have some students who come to Duke from other countries, for instance, who are coming here because they want to explore their identity. And um, they are very concerned about whether or not Duke is a safe place. We have families. I get um, emails, I get telephone calls from prospective parents mm -hmm. uh, wanting to know, is Duke an okay place? So help me understand, you, without violating anyone's confidence, tell me what one of those calls sounds like. The, um, phone, the phone rings, mom's on the line, or, and, and what does she say? Or better yet, they walk into the center. <laughs> even, be, even better. Which, and and what do they do. say? What do they say to you? Um, they say, well, we have our reservations about Duke. You're in the South. Right. Um, they feel like um, there's got to be a lot of bigotry here, that it must be a very backward place to be, mm -hmm. and their concern is, is this a safe place for my daughter or my son to be in school? And um, so there's definitely uh, a lot of sense of protectiveness there. They don't want to send their children to a place that is going to be unwelcoming or where they might perhaps be harmed. When yeah. you, um, Stephen. I was just wondering, when you explain to them what the, um, about the Duke statement on Amendment 1, uh, how does that help you? That seems to have been a, 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 been a very big step and uh, for this institution especially. Definitely. They love to hear that uh, Duke has lots of um, things in place that protect LGBT students. Mm. And the amendment that Jacob mentioned in his piece um, has gone a long way to say, he, here, here's the right. statement. And in fact, the university put out a statement uh, exactly. explicitly in support of the LGBT community on this issue. Yes. It took a little while, but it's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Stephen, we've gotten a question from Stuart, and let me pose this one to you. A 27-page analysis of the potential legal impact of the amendment by UNC School of Law faculty concludes that all unmarried couples would have fewer rights over their most important life decisions than they would have had otherwise. Do you think voters have sized up the real potential impact of this amendment? Uh, the questioner is right in his conclusion about that study. I've read that. And I think that it's been very difficult in this, in this environment to make clear the real damage that can and probably will occur if this amendment is passed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, it's being seen as um, you know, sort of the you know the gay marriage amendment, but um, there's a lot of collateral damage, like we were talking about earlier. Um, senior citizens, students, right. regardless of their sexual orientation. So um, it's uh, it's really important for voters to read these analyses, to listen to both sides, of course, but also to make their decisions based on on sources that are are documented and you know have real citations. Right. So you're not the only one who is expressing concerns about the potential impact of the amendment, including on the state's economy. 
Uh, Duke Law School recently held a panel that discussed the amendment, and one of the speakers was Sharon Thompson, a family attorney in Durham, who described what's been happening to some of her clients. We have an excerpt from that discussion. Let's listen. Many of my clients have moved from North Carolina because it can, we can no longer do second parent adoptions here where the partner adopts the biological um, person's child. So people have literally moved from North Carolina for that reason. And of course it limits people who might want to come otherwise come and be employed by Duke University or work uh, in the triangle in a tech company or something. They're going to maybe uh, think, tw think twice about it. Janie, Stephen, are you hearing similar concerns from the people you talk to? Absolutely. Uh, people, I have had inquiries from potential um, employees of the hospital, mm -hmm. of Duke Hospital. One Again, of help us understand what this really means in personal terms. Tell me about one of those conversations. Um, well, uh, they want to know if they come to Duke or if they come to Durham. Uh, sometimes they're not even coming to Duke. They're just coming to Durham. Right. Uh, how likely is it, if this amendment passes, that they're going to be able to have health insurance? Mm -hmm. And that answer, of course, is unclear at this point. Yeah. Uh, we think that private companies can still offer health benefits to domestic partners, but that really is not clear at this point. Right, and if they want a job like that, they are presumably well-educated, skilled mm -hmm. people who are the kinds of folks that you might want to have in a state's economy. Stephen, are you hearing similar kinds of things? I am, and you know, to make it um, to make it real, you know, some of the some of the questions I get are, right. are about, you know, if you're in if you're a straight um, domestic partnered couple, you could lose any domestic violence protections. You could lose your child custody arrangements because you would now be in a relationship that the state no longer sanctions. And um, you know, again, it's the collateral damage. It's written. The, the amendment is written so vaguely that uh, we don't know for sure. But it's possible that all of these things could come to pass. And so everyone really has some skin in this game. It's not just about uh, gays and lesbians. Mm -hmm. We invite you to join our conversation with Stephen Petro and Dr. Janie Long. You can send your questions by email to live at duke.edu, on Twitter using the tag Duke Live or on the Duke University Facebook page. Uh, we've received a question from James, and he, James asks, what do you think about language that recognizes civil unions or domestic partnerships but leaves out the question of marriage? Janie. Well, if this amendment passes, that is not even a question on the table anymore mm -hmm. because it is written in such a strong way uh, and there are only two other states. There are sort of three levels of these types of amendments. Yeah. One level uh, says no same-sex marriage. The second level says no same-sex marriage or civil union. And then the third level is you know, no domestic, no recognition of domestic partnerships at all. And that's the one that we'll be voting on. So if we vote this amendment in, there's not a chance, uh, even for civil unions. I'd also like to just make another point, which adds on to what Jamie yeah, said. Do. And um, you know, if you look back a little bit in time, marriage was not so high on the agenda for gay rights activists. It was only when these amendments started to pass and marriage was being taken away from us as a potential um, way to have our relationships that it mattered. And uh, Nobody now wants to settle for something that is second best, which a civil union is a second best kind of relationship. Right. So, you know, that's why it's become so important to have marriage. And I also want to note for everyone, because this is confusing too, even in states where there is same sex marriage, which mm -hmm. there's now six, those couples do not have any of the federal benefits that traditional or, you know, such uh, as such as veterans benefits, social security benefits. I mean, again, the bread and butter issues, there are 1,100 of those issues. So there's right. still a kind of discrimination going on even in the states where there is um, legal same-sex marriage. Right. Um, and as we're talking about costs or benefits, you also foresee that there may be legal costs in North Carolina if this amendment were to pass. Um, we could expect litigation. Absolutely. Do, what do you foresee there? Well, because of the vagueness of the terminology. It's really hard to tell what it means. Uh, the term that they use 
which escapes me at the moment, domestic legal union. Domestic legal union. Well, that's not clear, and it's never been interpreted by any court in North Carolina or in any other state. Yeah. So every time uh, there's a question, say in child custody cases uh, uh, having to do with uh, pension benefits, that's going to have to go to court. So there's going to be a lot of expense to sort of figure out what are the consequences of this very vague amendment. So the lawyers will do really the well. The lawyers will do well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there may be some lawyers watching who uh, maybe think that's, may not, think such a, that, yes. that's not such a bad indeed, thing. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so someone else who spoke about the economic impact recently at the Duke Law School seminar that we highlighted a moment ago was Ellie Kinnaird, mm -hmm. who represents Chatham and Orange Counties in the North Carolina State Senate. And she, too, voiced concerns about how passage of Amendment 1 might affect the state. So let's take a listen to that. But we know that there are repercussions. Pretty quickly, the business community came out strongly against it. And they wrote us, and they had, they had many, many signatories to saying, do not do this. The co-founder of Facebook was born in Hickory. And he wrote and he said, do not do this. Over and over they said, to bring in the best and the brightest and the most creative, we've got to have a, a, a welcoming atmosphere. And this is not a welcoming atmosphere. First we had the abortion bill, now we have this. This is not a welcoming atmosphere. So when companies come in, and I think there are 5,000 companies in the United States that recognize benefits for same-sex couples and, and domestic partners, heterosexual. And they were, they were very much opposed to this. That was Ellie Kinnaird. Stephen, we've been talking about the amendment for, uh, for the past half hour or so. Let's talk some politics. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen in this vote? Well, I thought you might ask me that today, so I, I looked into my crystal ball before I came here. Mm -hmm. And um, it, what I can tell you is the most important thing is that people come out and vote no on this amendment. Mm -hmm. The polls are fairly balanced. but right, what I've heard polls on both sides, actually. Yeah, and it's really hard to decipher them. Right. But in the end, the side that uh, galvanizes supporters to come out and vote on May 8th or in early voting uh, will dominate, and um, we hope that everybody who's listened to this program will really learn the facts and understand that we're all potentially um, at risk from this amendment. And if they wanted to get more information, are there any websites or other places you might suggest they take a look at? There's a wonderful website, and correct me if I don't have it right, but it's, um, but, but I believe, protectallnorthcarolinafamilies.org. All in Yes. And, and Janie, before I ask you that final question, let me, let me just share one question we've gotten uh, on Twitter from Courtney who says, do you think there's a major discrepancy in the way the younger generation and the older generation <laughs> view this amendment? Absolutely. And how, what, describe Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Well, it's very interesting to me, uh, just this week, there was a panel bringing together members of uh, Duke Republicans, Duke Democrats, and our undergraduate group, yeah. uh, the LGBT undergraduate group. And they all found common ground, which says we are against this amendment. If you look at the recent statement by Harvey Gantt and uh, Richard Venroot, the former, the former mayors, mayors of Charlotte, of Charlotte mm -hmm. one Republican, one Democrat. Right. Um, and you noted earlier in our discussion that you thought it was the Republicans gaining control of the legislature in North Carolina that had some correlation to this becoming more of an issue. Right. And you're saying that the Republican student group here at Duke is joining in opposition. Is joining in opposition. Stephen, Absolutely. what are we to make of that more? Do you think that's something that more is happening more generally in the state and, and nationwide in perceptions of the issue? So there the polls are really clear cut. When you look at um, generational splits, younger people, they just don't even care about this issue. They care about health insurance, they care about jobs. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a modern family world for, for these folks. And yeah. um, I think that's very encouraging to all of us because no matter what happens here on May 8th, the train has left the station on right. this particular So you feel like issue. the tide of history is on your side? Definitely. It's a long arc, but it's on our side. Yeah. Janie Long, any final thoughts about that from you or requests for people who might be watching? My final thought would be, if you vote against this amendment, you won't be hurting anyone. If you vote for it, there are lots and lots of potential harmful consequences for children, for families, for our senior citizens. Mm -hmm. Vote against it. 
Okay, we've gotten uh, one uh, final message from someone at protectncfamilies.org who says that if people are looking for more information, they invite uh, our viewers to, to check out their website as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I also want to thank again Rachel Lee from Vote for Marriage NC for speaking with us yesterday and taking part in our discussion. Stephen Petro is a journalist and author who writes frequently about LGBT issues, a Duke alum, we're proud to say. Janie Long is the director of the Center for LGBT Life here at Duke University. You can watch a recording of this conversation along with many other videos from Duke University at Duke On Demand. That's ondemand.duke.edu. But for now, thanks for watching. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.